Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this um, webinar on the uh, statutory complaint handling code. Um, I can see some people are still joining, so I'll just give it a few seconds to give everybody a chance to um, join the room. Um, but I'm Anthea Chilton, and I'm one of the sector learning and development leads here at the Housing Ombudsman Service. Um, it's a really quick hello from me, really, um, before I hand over to Jamie and, and Jamie's team. Um, and Jamie's going to give you um, an overview of the code before answering your questions, um, which some of you have submitted beforehand. So that's great. Thank you very much for you, um, to those of you that did that. Um, but there'll also be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation. So if, if I could ask you to please keep muted um, uh, for now, but there'll be um, a chance for you to um, pop your hands up after the presentation to ask questions. Um, and also, so then we'll... Uh, oops, sorry, sorry. Um, but also we'll uh, then at the end uh, go to the pre-submitted questions and then look at some of the questions in the chat as well. So if you if you have any questions um, as we go along, um, please just uh, pop them in the chat. Um, just to make you aware as well, this session is going to be recorded um, and it will be made available um, online for our Centre for Learning, just for those of those people that weren't able to, to make it this morning. Um, so uh, that's it for me uh, for now. So thank you very much for, for joining and uh, over to you, Jamie. Sorry, Can you hear me? I had trouble uh, unmuting myself then. Yes, can hear you. Fab. OK, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, my name is Jamie Strong. I'm one of the managers here at the Housing Ombudsman Service, um, and I've been working on the statutory code um, along with lots of other people um, and also our duty to monitor. So. I'm going to um, talk to you a bit about sort of the history of the code and where all the way up to where we are now. It's it's very, it's, it's a short presentation, don't worry, and we'll share the slides afterwards. Um, so hopefully the majority of you will be familiar with our complaint handling code because um, we, we we first launched it in 2020. Um, we worked with landlords, residents um, and, and staff um, and stakeholders at that time and published it in 2020. Um, it's in line with our um, scheme, so all members of our scheme are, are required to follow the complaint handling code um, and it essentially sets out requirements um, to support efficient and um, uh, fair complaint handling. Um, it focuses on the landlord's own complaint handling, um, so support um, when complaints are within the landlord's own procedure, um, so that bit before it comes to us actually. Um, sets out what a landlord must do procedurally to handle complaints um, and it enables landlords to embed a positive complaint handling culture. So um, from there we have updated the complaint handling code um, once more since then and then in July 2023 the Social Housing Regulation Act 2023 um, amended our powers um, in relation to the complaint handling code. So um, it gave us the power to issue a statutory code of practice for complaint handling, and that is our complaint handling code, or we will call it the code. Um, it's um, also explained that in order for us to issue that statutory code of practice, um, we had to carry out a statutory consultation and that once we had issued that statutory code of practice, the code, we had a duty to monitor a landlord's compliance with the code. So I'm gonna talk a bit about the consultation itself. So it opened up in September, 2023. Um, we did a lot of work speaking with um, uh, uh, and, and 1,000 over 1,200 individuals about our proposals um, to try and sort of raise awareness and also ask people to to um, um, engage with the consultation. Um, and we did that over webinars, in-person events, and meetings. Um, we received over 600 responses um, to our consultation, and that was from residents, landlords, and stakeholders. And um, we received um, one th over 1,400 comments um, and we read them all individually and, and did a bit of analysis on, analysis on those to help us decide what we do with the code going forward. 
Um, just to give you some um, information about sort of our findings, there is further information in the code consultation response document that you'll find on our website. But overall, there was um, support for the provisions of the code um, from um, landlords and residents. Key themes from residents were that there were barriers to um, making complaints, that there were delays to receiving the complaint responses, um, and that they felt that there was a need for independent review of complaints. Key themes from landlords were that um, they were concerned around the volumes that they would receive as a result of the complaint handling code, that, that it would be um, it would impact them on resources and capacity, and also the concern around still being able to deliver um, a good quality service um, whilst um, complying with the code. Um, both residents and landlords um, ask for more guidance and support to ensure um, code compliance. And we also received a number of um, suggestions, ideas and recommendations for our work, which has been really handy. We have used that to inform our guidance that we have been um, issuing. Um, as I say, there are there is more information on that code um, consultation response document. So the outcome. So um, we have now issued the statutory complaint handling code, um, which applies to all members of the housing ombudsman scheme. As I said, most of the um, responses were actually um, in favour of the um, code that we consulted on. And therefore, the, the code that we consulted on um, and the code that we have now isn't actually too different. Um, I'll talk to you uh, in a minute about the main differences um, between the code that's in place at the moment and, and the code that um, is going live in April. Um, but uh, just to let you know, we've also published um, not only the complaint handling code, um, but we've published our self-assessment um, that landlords can use to assess themselves against the code. Um, we have um, uh, published a set of frequently asked questions, which um, my team are continually to um, continuing to review and add to as and when landlords contact us and ask questions about the code. Um, we issued, um, well, we completed and then published an equality impact assessment um, of the code. So that looked at the um, equality in, um, implications of, of, of the code and the duty to monitor. Um, we published our code compliance framework. So that talked about sort of how we intend to monitor landlords compliance with the code. And we also published um, some guidance uh, around our complaint handling failure orders, our CHFOs. Um, and that is for CHFOs that are um, for type one, type two and type three. All of this information you can find on our website. Um, so, so do have a look and, and familiarise yourself with those. So key changes to the code that um, starts in, in the 1st of April 2024 compared to the one that we've got now. Um, there is a easy reference guide that you can also look at on our website, um, which will help you see the sort of differences. Um, but key points um, would be that um, landlords complaints policies must have two stages only. So no longer any sort of informal stages or third stages. Um, it's two stages only. And that includes um, where a landlord who chooses to use a third party to handle part of its complaints um, that third party involvement would have to be part of that two stage process. Um, Timescales and requirements for acknowledging um, complaints at each, each stage. So it's it's very clear now that um, a landlord must acknowledge a complaint within five working days of the complaint being received. And um, it also must acknowledge the complaint at stage two, so within five working days of that stage two request being received. It also talks about having the complaint, um, the, the, the definitions of the complaint in that acknowledgement, so making it really clear at the outset that the landlord has understood and heard what the resident's complaint is. Um, Timescales for 
responding to each um, complaint, um, uh, sorry, to, to responding to complaint at each stage, including the timescales permitted for extensions. So the landlord has the five working days to acknowledge the complaint and then at stage one, it's 10 working days from the date that that complaint is acknowledged. And that's at stage one. At stage two, it's 20 working days from the date that the um, stage two is acknowledged. Um, there, as I say, it talks about the extension. So a landlord is permitted to extend um, a stage one complaint by a further 10 working days and it's permitted to, admit to extend the timescales at stage two by a further 20 working days. Um, it talks about exclusions um, to raising or escalating complaints. So one of the big, big changes, I suppose, is that um, a resident has 12 months to bring their complaint to the landlord now. Um, that's from the date that they became aware of the, the issue or when the issue took place. So 12 months instead of six months, it's probably the biggest change there. It talks about resourcing arrangements, um, including the need now to have a member responsible for complaints. Um, so that is a member of the landlord um, that, that is responsible for complaints. There's a, a whole section on our website that also talks about the member responsible for complaints. Um, role. So do have a look at that. Um, the requirements it, um, to produce and publish an annual complaints performance and service improvement report. So that's something that we're asking landlords to do annually. Um, it includes the self-assessment against the code and then it talks, it's a report. Um, the code itself does list the the, the uh, things, the topics that we'd, we'd like covered in that report. There's no set template, but it does say what we would expect to see in that report. So a landlord can put that report together themselves. Um, as we just ask that it does include the, the um, bullet points in the code, as well as the self-assessment. And then I'll talk a bit about our duty to monitor compliance. So as I've said, the statutory code um, applies from the 1st of April 2024 and so our duty to monitor uh, landlords compliance with that the code also takes effect from that date. Um, we have uh, published our code compliance framework which details our sort of high level approach to this. Um, the um, key sort of main main three ways that we'll be doing this um, is the, the first bit is all about the landlord assuring itself that it applies with the code um, in both in practice and policy. So um, we call it the um, compliance in oversight and scrutiny. So that's all about the landlord completing its self-assessment um, annually and also completing the um, uh, complaints performance and service improvement report um, and publishing it on their website and also um, submitting that to the Ombudsman. So there will be a requirement for landlords to provide a submission to the, the Ombudsman annually and it, it, it's those two things, the self-assessment and that report. Um, but that's all about the landlord really going through that and assuring itself that it does meet the code. The next is um, the Housing Ombudsman. We will um, check landlord's compliance in policy. So we will be checking to see um, whether it, in fact your complaints policy does match and, and, and meet the code. Um, and then we'll be looking at compliance in practice. So we'll be using the data that we hold on landlords to um, see actually can we see that what they're doing does support the fact that they are following the code in practice and where we don't have that evidence um, we can still do that, but we would ask the landlord for that evidence. Um, so when um, assessing compliance, really um, we, we're asking the landlord to do that first bit, the oversight and scrutiny to, to assure themselves that they are um, compliant with the code. Um, there's the, um, the self-assessment, really, if a landlord follows that and goes through that, they should really be able to tell whether they do meet it or don't meet it and the changes that they'll need to make to their policies in order to meet it. 
Um, if we do notice that actually that, that something isn't quite compliant with the code, then we will engage with landlords and we will give them the opportunity to try and resolve those issues identified in the first instance. We'll try and support landlords through that where we can. If um, a landlord um, doesn't um, engage with us and doesn't complete the sort of changes that we've uh, suggested of them, then we will issue complaint handling failure orders and those um, complaint handling failure orders uh, would, would be published. Um, further information, as I said, is in our complaint handling failure guidance that's on the website. Um, so for support um, for landlords, so we've, as I've mentioned, we have got our um, dedicated web pages that talks about the, um, it, the, the different documents I've spoke about today. Um, we've got the member responsible for complaints page on there as well, which is really informative. Um, these FAQs um, that we are continuing, continually reviewing and we will add to them where, where common questions do pop up from landlords. So have a read through those. Um, we're also um, currently in the in the process of um, completing guidance for self-assessments and um, guidance on submitting the self-assessment, including the timescales. So that will be published um, from early April. And then the um, we've got a code e-learn that will be available um, hopefully around that time too. And we plan to throughout the, the year um, publish micro learns on specific sort of topics or aspects around the code. Um, we will continue to do webinars like this throughout 2024, 2025. We, um, they might change and they might be about specific topics, but do keep looking at our website because any uh, webinars or things like that that we've got, any support for landlords that will be on our website, um, our centre for learning also. Um, we'll have this that the code e learns and things like that on it. Um, finally, the um, we have our dedicated um, email, which is compliance at housing-ombudsman.org.uk, and you can, if you've got any specific questions about the code, you can contact us using that web that email address, and um, my team will get back to you um, and, and answer your questions around the code. It is specifically for um, questions around the complaint handling code. If you've got any questions around um, individual cases, then please continue contacting us in the in the way you have always done. And I think that's it on the presentation. So what we'll do now is we'll pause and um, see if you guys have any questions around what I've just discussed there. Um, and then if after that, we'll move on to the pre-submitted questions. You can, um, if you raise your hand, um, if you do have any questions, and we'll go through those, um, or you can raise questions in the chat as well. Uh, so we've got a question from Sarah. Um, yeah, hi, I've, I've um, I work for um, a, a small co-op in, in northwest London. Um, I've recently been um, reviewing and revising their complaints policy with them. Um, and um, I, 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 I based it on, on um, a, a model that was provided to me. It, it does concern me a bit that, that most of you, your complaints, your your complaints handling guide is really focused on larger organisations. Um, essentially, we I work two days a week, um, and you know that a lot of the work in the co-op is done by volunteers, and and it's as if you are expecting them to meet the same standards you as as you, as you would expect a a large landlord to 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 meet. Um, I mean the the the, the issue around particularly the um, there are issues around time scale. Um, I mean, you're saying we we must respond to to complaints within five working days. I work two days a week. It is it it entirely possible that that we will we will regularly miss this requirement simply because I'm not in the office to to pick up a complaint that comes in um, and and respond to it. Um, and there is no one else to do this work. Um, and the the requirements around having a, a a member responsible for complaints. I'm the only worker. 
you know, I, I have to be responsible for complaints. Um, I, I just feel that you're, you you have not taken into account the special circumstances of housing carps with with um you know that are small organizations and have very few staff and do most of their work with with um with the the help of volunteers um can you can you sort of give me some guidance on that thank you sarah um i what i would i was <clears> just going to say is um we we absolutely do recognize that we have um uh, a very diverse range of different types of landlords that provide various different services um and you know that's that's that was why we we went out to consultation as well to get the views from various different landlords um that i i do appreciate that that feedback and i thank you um for raising that i am going to hand over to my colleague kirsty um to give you some pointers on that one Thank you. We have had another pre-submitted question which kind of parallels your concern. So I suppose it makes sense if I address that overall, if that's OK. So the first thing to say is just on that five working days, that's just about the acknowledgement. From the date of acknowledgement, it's then 10 working days to investigate and provide the response. And that can be extended by another 10 working days. So I appreciate that that's challenging for smaller landlords, but ultimately, what we're trying to do is extend fairness across the whole sector, regardless of who the landlord is. And I think from a practical point of view, at what, you know, at what point do you draw the line? Otherwise, do you say if you have a stock of five, five properties, that's OK, but six properties isn't? It becomes quite challenging. And ultimately, given that, the you know, the purpose of the introduction of the code, you know, four years ago was about trying to drive improvements and consistency across the sector in complaint handling that still applies and that's the reason that it's now become statutory so i don't want you to feel we're not listening because we do genuinely hear your concerns and we are here to support you however we can to do that and obviously cch i can see in the chat are just finalizing guidance to publish as well but the code is is the reality is the code is now statutory and so there will be an obligation um, by landlords to meet that. Thanks, Kirsty. Have we got any more questions? No? Oh, Anna, yes, please. Hi, hi everyone. Sorry, um, I'm a lawyer, so I'm, I'm not a co-op member, but I do get quite a lot of um, queries from uh, various clients who are cops, and the issues they have sometimes are that complaints can be quite personal. So, it, because it's a membership, they date back years. They'll refer back to, you know, incidents that happened in twenty. 15, for example, I mean, is there any guidance that you can give to uh, cops in terms of how to deal with that? Because sometimes, uh, say, the focus will be on, say, the administrator who isn't even a member of the co-op. How, how are they supposed to deal with that? Should they have a separate subcommittee? How, what would you recommend? So it's really up to individual landlords, their governance structure, because as Jamie reflected, we have such a diverse um, membership from you know arms houses with four properties to large London landlords with half a million you know they're not yeah so we aren't overly prescriptive we are prescriptive there needs to be a member responsible for complaint but right. that's kind of it what I'd also say is the acknowledgement says um that sorry within the acknowledgement the landlord should define the complaint now that can be a good opportunity to set the parameters so right. we'd normally expect that, that people raise concerns within 12 months of the matter arising. So although it might be they're referring to things back in 2015, often for them, that's an illustration that this has happened before. And it's yeah. about setting the parameters like, OK, you've given us some background, but the current issue is limited to this right. and being quite specific in setting that. And I think, you know, the acknowledgement and the chance to define the complaint there means that the parties before the investigation starts are all on the same page and if there's a dispute it can be resolved then before time is expended in investigating the complaint and actually there's been a misunderstanding yeah okay 
Yeah. Does that answer your question or have I missed Well, Laura, I, th I think it's it's something, unfortunately, for the co-ops will have to grapple with um, themselves, essentially, um, that there, there's, I don't want to say there's always a difficult member, but there's usually somebody uh, and a bit of funny relationships going back years, which can create um, more personal gripes. Um, and I think is, it is. Is there to scope to point out if there's a vexatious person or you, you consider, you know, is that something that you could say and label or would it be you need to be more open every time? So the code does say that landlords need to have a policy in place for dealing with unreasonable behaviour. Yeah. Um, so that could set out um, when someone's behaviour, you know, and that doesn't even include, you know, we, we're not limiting that just to complaints. That's about right. unreasonable behaviour in the contact with the organisation. So that could lend itself to lots of different scenarios. Um, and there's a process that we'd expect a landlord would follow um, if they're going to, for example, restrict someone's contact because of their behaviour, a right to appeal, etc. Yeah. Um, so there's options in place. But you know, people we'd we'd want if someone had had their contact restricted, for example, but they'd raised complaints, we would expect a landlord to look and check that the issue that they're raising falls under that restriction. They're not complaining about something new that, right. you know, where a complaint should be addressed. It shouldn't just be a blanket. You know, we're not going to ever accept any contact from you because they might be raising. I don't want to say legitimate concerns because that's kind of a bit pejorative, but you know yeah. you understand so what it, I mean. So if they get the I don't know for example eight page complaint they do need to read through it and just check there's nothing new essentially. Correct. Yeah, yeah. okay thank you. So I think we've got a hand up from Sarah or was that one we'd already have? If not you had a hand up from me and I've just unmuted myself sorry this is Julian House from Bristol Housing Co-op um, it, this all looks very, very sensible in some ways, though. Yes, you know, it is a resource burden upon small co-ops like ours with like 80 odd, 80 odd properties. Um, but, you know, that's it is what it is. What I was wanted to specifically ask for, you've just gone through the process of the timelines for us to respond. And following on from the last uh, 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 comments that were made. OK, so we receive a complaint which we is very, very inchoate, is the six pages of green ink or whatever. And we have to then look at it and say, OK, we have now identified your complaint as A and B and C and D. Do you agree or do you disagree? Now, if the person turns around and says, I disagree and I will get back to you and takes two, one, two, three months to do so, what do we do about that? Does that put out outside the code of being able to deal with it? You know, what's the guidance that you would give in that sort of circumstance? I, if it's if the, if these are always challenging, hence why you're asking the question. They're always difficult where a, resident the makes a, where a resident makes a complaint and then perhaps doesn't want to engage in the process. I think if it's at the earliest point, where the parties aren't clear on what the substantive issue is that they're complaining about, then perhaps you know you could your records could reflect that you're waiting the residents come back and clarify before you can start investigating it. And, and, and put it on hold until that. Would that put us outside the guidance? Would that put us outside the guidance? Or would it not put us outside the guidance? <laughs> I'm sorry, can you say that again? I, I missed what you said. So in, in those circumstances, would we be inside the guidance or outside of the guidance in terms of our expected response times? I would say if you're still waiting for clarification from the resident about what the complaint is about, you would still be within the time frame until the resident responded. I don't know if the one, that there are other thoughts. Stage two, if they do not respond, one it depends how much you've got at stage two whether there's enough to read because at stage two there will already have been an investigation so if someone then reflects that they're unhappy with that we would still expect regardless of whether if you went back and said have what are the reasons you're still unhappy and they didn't reply we'd still expect that stage two was carried out because it's about a fresh pair of eyes looking at the concerns raised and what's happened 
So although so, so it's helpful... Just to, clarify, if... just to clarify, what you've said is that come somebody comes to us with a stage one complaint, um, which we then have to help them define in a certain way and say, we take your complaint as A and B and C and D, and they do not respond to us, then effectively we can have a complaints panel hearing which goes, which actually looks at the issue on the basis of the way that we have defined, right, what they have said to us, which they have not agreed to, which then, right, we then feed back to them and they say, no, but it's over. And then we say, okay, we'll go to the housing office person. Is that, it, that, that to me would be the... Because there would then be a second stage, wouldn't there? It wouldn't be a one-stage complaint procedure. No, that's what I've just said. We and the second stage is they're still not engaging, so we have to determine the outcome of the complaint and what we're prepared to do about it on the basis of the definition that we have made. If they are not, if they are not engaging with us, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's fine. That's clear. Thank you. Because. Because, I, I, I mean, so one, it would be about your interpretation based on what they provided. But complaints aren't just about responding to that individual. It's also about the learning you can take from them. So when you investigate the resident's concerns, you may actually identify that there's improvements that can be made within the service or, you know, there's other issues in the service delivery that have been helpful to highlight and resolve. So it's not you know, it's taking maybe a wider view of the concerns being raised and the benefit in doing so. I'm not saying the exercise isn't valuable. What I am saying is that that doesn't actually help us resolve and manage the individual's concerns in a way which is 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 appropriate under this system. That's all I say. So I, you know. I appreciate when someone makes a complaint and then doesn't want to engage in the process, that is difficult. But I think you can only make your best efforts. Thank you. Um, we've got a question, I think, here from Dave. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, it was, I think, the two gentlemen uh, and somebody who was speaking before, and it's our concerns. We are a smallish cop with uh, 75 properties. And we have the same problem as these guys, which is we're volunteers. We're a non-profit making organization and all the new regulation has put quite a strain on our abilities to get everything in order. We have quite a lot of stuff to do with maintenance. Uh, we have the fire regulations. We've reported on this. We find some of the issues rather clumsy uh, and time consuming. Uh, just saying that we learn from these things is not really very helpful. Is there any way that the, the government is uh, about to provide any extra financial assistance for cops who are non-profit making, who um, get their only income basically from rent, and who are bit up against the wall with the massive amount of work that needs to be done by volunteers, which we all are, even though I've been here for nearly 50 years, we're still volunteers at the end of the day, and we've learned a great deal, probably more than than many, but it still takes a lot of time and expense. So is there any means that you would provide financial assistance to co-ops who find themselves in a difficult position? Not that we particularly are, but in general, there will be co-ops who will find themselves. Not It's not necessarily about complaints procedures, but this is one area, listening to the the dialogue that uh, can take time and effort and can be quite difficult. Um, so it seems um, to us in a way that the government hasn't understood the total difference between somebody who uh, is employing lots of professional staff to handle these businesses and these matters and those of us who, who deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis uh, as a volunteer. So we and we aren't the government as such. We're an arm's length body. The first thing to say, we aren't a grant making organisation. So you know it would be outside of our remit to offer financial assistance to any landlord. I can't, you know, because we aren't, you know, the government as such. I can't speak to any plans that you know they have in mind about offering financial assistance. I know the sector as a whole 
is concerned and asking for sort of 10 year rent setting plans. Now, whether that's on the government's agenda, I don't know, you know, so that they can forecast the likely income they'll have coming in and plan. But, you know, I, I don't think co-ops are alone in finding things financially difficult in the sector, but we can't speak to that. The regulator ultimately is responsible for um, the sort of financial positions or no, that's not fair. The regulator is responsible for assessing um, landlords financial positions and taking a view on them. That's not what we do. So unfortunately, I appreciate that's quite a vague answer, but I, you know, I can't address those concerns, I'm afraid. That's OK. Um, I'm just throwing out uh, a few things just to see where you actually stand on this. I realise it's not your particular area, but there are those who've been here a long time who think that uh, it's all very well to do our very best for our tenants. Of course, we are all tenants and in our case, we're tenants and landlords. So it's a bit of a dichotomy it's that we need to try and resolve some of these issues. It's not really quite good enough to say a 10 year maintenance plan, a 10 year uh, rent plan. Uh, it's going to mean an awful lot more work for a lot of people who are getting <laughs> getting on a bit in life now and uh, we can't always replace our long-standing and uh, knowledgeable uh, members with with new faces so we're always going to be up against it because of the very nature of cops that we took on these nearly 45 years ago in my case we wanted to do this because it meant we looked after our own business i feel housing cops are in a slightly different bracket than a large uh, <clears throat> A large organization with you know several hundred thousand properties which have plenty of workers i know this isn't really your concern but i'd like to i'm sure there's plenty of people listening here who will be understanding where i'm coming from it's not going to get any easier and it seems to me that uh, these measures from the government are somewhat of a knee, re knee jerk reaction to things that have gone on but that's neither here nor there. this is the statutory truth of the matter we understand that but um, thank you for your comments anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, I'm just going to pivot to the pre-submitted um, questions just to make sure we definitely cover those today. So, um, Bethan, are you able to, to read one out for Kirsty, please? Yeah, of course. Um, so we've got the first one from Princes Park Housing Cooperative. Um, if a cooperative does not have its own website, as it only has 15 tenant members and its managing agent's website is corporate, would the ombudsman insist on managing agent displaying policies and information for the 32 co-ops co it provides services to on its website? I just wanted to ask, is the person from Princes Park here? And can they clarify if the managing agent deals with the complaints on their behalf? OK, they're not. I will answer that. If the managing agent deals with complaints on their behalf, then we would expect the policies to be available on their website. If they don't and the co-op deals with the complaints themselves, we don't expect landlords to have a website. So if they don't have one, then obviously there's you know nothing to display the policy on um, digitally. But we would then expect the policy sufficiently publicised through other channels. So that might be leaflets mailed out on notice boards, social media. You know, it really, you know, your demographic and your residents. So you'll know what the best way of communicating that to them. But it just must be um, sufficiently accessible and publicised. Thank you. Um, was there another one, Bethan? Um, yes, so I think you answered the number two already kind of about um um about how it's run by volunteers we've covered a lot of that um so another one is the 24 code states that landlord is not permitted to have any informal complaint stages does this reconcile with or is it a departure from the 2020 cch guidance on complaint handling within housing cooperatives so what we found in our practice is that informal stages often lead to confusion. Residents think they've made a complaint and these, although often they've been sort of brought in as a quick fix, the complaint drifts and because there's no firm deadline, you know, they go on and it leads to confusion between the parties. So the landlord needs to be clear. What's the service complaint? 
initially reporting a repair, reporting some sort of antisocial behaviour, and what is a complaint about the handling of that. So once someone says, you said you'd repair my tap, it's been four months and I'm not happy with the delay, we'd expect the landlord at that point to offer access to the formal complaint procedure. And that would be at stage one. We wouldn't expect that that was then logged informally or alternatively, we wouldn't accept that that expect, sorry, that that was logged as a further service request. So, oh, sorry, that hasn't happened. We'll raise the repair again. They should be offered, you know, the repair should be chased up, but also the resident should be offered the chance to make a complaint. We do understand that, you know, co-ops, it's a unique situation. Some people might not want to make a complaint, but they should be given that opportunity. And if they then change their mind at a later date, you know, OK, no, I don't want to make a complaint now. But, you know, the tap remains unfixed, that that opportunity is then extended again. Thank you. Um, and I think that's all the pre-submitted ones covered then. Is that right? It is. There are a few more in the chat, though. Yeah, there's some we've, more in the chat if you want me to move to them or we've got some other hands up as well. We've got a couple more hands up. So um, if I move to Kerry. Hi, yeah, uh, I'm the I'm from Northwest Housing Services. So we're managing agents. I was the Princess Park question about the website. Um, we don't actually, we just guide our tenant volunteers through the process. So we don't deal with the complaint for them. We just help them uh, write the letters and the correspondence and keep on top of the timeframes for them. <clears throat> but it's those, those who interview, it's those who do the stage one, stage two investigation. Um, so thanks for clarifying that because I've had advice back from your colleagues to say it needs to be on our on the corporate website. So that's incorrect now from what you're saying. So I'll I'll need to challenge that. Anyway, I wanted to ask about the um, the performance and improvement report. So with the compliant new complaint handling code coming in in April 24, are you expecting that report to have to be submitted? I'm guessing in sort of May, June 25 or so for small year landlords, end or yeah so for small I'm, I might have to def defer my understanding is for small landlords below 1000 properties it's is it within 12 weeks of submission to account I'm sorry I I have to look this up every time yeah it's within three months, three months yeah that's it it's within three months of um, when um, the, the small landlords required to um, publish its TSMs or within three months from the date of their year end, whichever soonest. Just because we'll, we'll obviously have to diarise that in because that's going to be a massive, a massive piece of work for the 32 co-ops that we provide services to. So, OK. That's for it. large Thank landlord, you. it's a fixed date because the re, um, return of TSMs is fixed by the regulator. Um, but we appreciate that smaller landlords don't um, necessarily run April to March. Um, so that's why there's that flexibility within that for their financial year. OK, thanks. Thank you. Um, so moving on to Nick. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm um, Nick Bliss. I work with a couple of co-ops in the Midlands and um, I, well, people here, some big people here will know that I've had a lifetime of involvement with housing cooperatives and actually I worked with the CCH on drawing up their RIP first guidance, which actually, you know, the, the Ombudsman worked quite closely with the CCH on, which was good. Um, I'm just, I mean, you know, in terms of the sort of debate that's been going on here, I mean, I'm fully conversant with the reasons why the Ombudsman is, has, has brought in the changes, because obviously there's been some really shocking instances of complaints not being properly addressed right across the sector, including, sadly, in some co-ops as well. Um, so I can understand what you're trying to do, um, but I also hear the concerns of the smaller co-ops and, and, you know, that is quite a, a thing. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, how much you guys at the Ombudsman are sort of conversant with the fact that housing cops are so culturally different from housing associations. 
and you know whether you've kind of had training sessions yourselves on how housing co-ops work and um and whether i mean by i've put this in the chat but you know whether you know in terms of the practicalities of, of managing problems that might arise um with individual housing co-ops will you contact the cch to discuss cases as they come up because you know there's going to be learning for the sector and and for yourselves in terms of how best to address problems that may arise within housing co-ops do you get the gist so of what i'm talking about yeah yeah we recognize that obviously cch has particular expertise in co-ops more broadly our expertise sit within specifically complaint handling as opposed mm. to the entire operations of co-ops we will be publishing our learning on our center for learning which is going to be constantly updated but that you know is likely to be you know relevant for all landlords um, about best practice not necessarily specific to co-ops well, I mean, I think the point I'm trying to get across here is, is there are cultural, substantial cultural differences between housing associations and housing co-ops, which are, you know, you, you've got a flavour of that in, in, in the session that's come across here. So, you know, the Ombudsman is going to have to be quite conversant with the cultural differences. And I'm, I revert to my question is, do you feel that you understand that cultural difference? Because you're going to have to understand it in order to be able to properly you know if 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 the intention is to try and be supportive of landlords you know meeting the code in the best possible way which you know i would absolutely applaud then um, then you're going to need to understand you know the cultural differences of housing cooperatives are you not and and do you feel that you do that's the question i'm asking and what are you going to do I about feel, it if you don't i feel like we do understand you know, our diverse membership, but ultimately we've been given the role of monitoring all landlords' compliance with the code. So even if there is kind of cultural differences, we will be holding all landlords to the same standard of compliance with the code. We we do absolutely see the differences as well, don't we, in our casework that comes across and and that's not just co-ops like um you know our abbey fields and arms houses there's there's a massive difference to that and and the and the big housing associations there's difference with um local authorities and yeah we we do see it in our casework 100 percent um i'm gonna move on to um is it sheeran Sh sorry shireen thank you jamie um so i'm here on behalf of maynard and rosswalk cooperatives and I just wanted some um, clarity, actually, on something you've already talked about following on from the informal complaints question or, or query. Um, I currently hold weekly housing surgeries and they are very busy surgeries. And all I'll receive in these surgeries are complaints about, you know, outstanding repair or chasing repairs. Um, but they won't necessarily use the word complaint. So from my understanding, um, from what we've talked about so far is that I would chase it for them, deal with the issue at hand, but then offer whether they want to make this an official complaint and then I would forward it to the managing agent. Is that is that correct? So the complaint definition that we've asked landlords to adopt says um, a complaint is an expression of dissatisfaction and they don't need to use the word complaint for it to be treated as such. So if someone is chasing an overdue, you know, a quote unquote overdue repair, we would say, you know, give the resident an opportunity at that point to raise a complaint alongside chasing the response to the repair. Yeah. And then it's up to them whether or not they want to make that complaint. OK, um, yeah, that definitely helps. Thank you for that, Kirsty. No problem. Um, Sarah. Hi, yeah, I just I just wanted to come back to this this issue of support. Um, I, I don't think that that anybody um, in the sector is is asking for some kind of financial support, um, though, of course, if you want if you wanted to offer it, we'd be delighted to receive it. <laughs> um, I think it's it's more um, perhaps a, a recognition of how um, the nature of co-ops, small, you know, essentially volunteer run, um, often, um, you know, just one one or two workers at, at the most, um, how that actually impacts on how well they can, we can comply with, with the code um, 
tightly. I think that we we would all recognise the importance of, of 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 complying with the spirit of the code, but I I do worry um, a bit about the the housing ombudsman's tendency to to sort of like find um, look to find against landlords for the most technical trivial breaches of 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 the code, um, you know, particularly around. Uh, I, I'm I'm a bit of a complaint junkie. I must admit, I've been on your website and I've read your your um, your findings into your investigations, which have always been fascinating. And you know, there's there's a lot of really good stuff there about how in what ways you can learn from complaints. But I I, I was struck by a couple of complaints which were to me uh, investigations which to me were extraordinarily trivial. One was about someone's uh, ring doorbell, um, and the the um, to me, that the landlord had had dealt with it very well, but you still managed to find against them because they they um, not followed their antisocial behaviour policy um, to to the letter. Um, and uh, you know, without going into too much detail, I, I I thought actually from the from the start, this should not have been just defined as antisocial behaviour. They'd have been better off so, mm -hmm. saying no, we we're taking this as a complaint, <laughs> but not as a complaint of antisocial behaviour. Um, but I think the, 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 this is kind of where we're coming from. That that um, you know, the, the the nature of cops is is such that you know it's not just volunteer run. It's just that people in the cop all know one another. So it is very hard to have proper, fresh, independent views. Um, the cop I work for, like most cops, has a particular member who is um, a. a vexatious complainer he's, he has had six complaints in in, in the six months um in the last six months each complaint he is uh, this this person has has raised to to um gone through all the stages of the complaints the cult's complaints procedure and he's still not satisfied and will never be satisfied um and i know that if this person goes to the housing ombudsman you'll find against us because there will be some mistake that we've made um however trivial um, and it, unfortunately, to me, that kind of encourages that person. Um, but uh, just trying to bring it back to what I'm trying to express, which which is which is that you know what we would appreciate is some understanding, some flexibility around um, you know look not not finding against us for the most trivial of reasons, most technical breaches, and also add, added to that, you know. What complaint do you consider too trivial for you to carry out an investigation on? Because really, um, some of the stuff I've seen is just quite extraordinary. I'm oh, sorry if that came across as hostile. I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm just trying to get um, a, a sense of of how you feel you could support us in in better, um, mm -hmm. to particularly to provide a better service to 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 the residents. Thank you. So, what I there's quite a few points so I'm going to have a go at hitting them and if I've missed anything tell me so the first thing to say is the local government ombudsman they set a threshold before they'll accept complaints of serious detriment we don't so pretty much pretty much anyone can refer their complaint to us that's reached the end of a landlord's complaint procedure certain ones that we consider frivolous we might not look at but I've been here for nearly eight years and I can only think of maybe twice that we've used it. So we generally will look at everything within our jurisdiction that's referred to us. Um, the When we investigate a case, we're impartial. So we're not there to represent the tenant. We're impartial to you know look at it with a fresh pair of eyes. And what we're doing is looking at it in the round. So you will you know, or if, if you went through our casework, you might find where we've said, yeah, this did go wrong, but, you know, in the round, it didn't make a difference to the outcome. So just because we find some things weren't quite right, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to make a finding. We might identify that it's not been right, but it hasn't made, you know, a, a difference materially to the overall outcome. So, you know, we wouldn't find maladministration on every single technicality unless we found that that, you know, issue had created some sort of detriment to the resident. Have I missed something as well? Uh, no, no, you haven't. Um, I, I think that um, 
I maybe I, I didn't express myself very clearly. I can't. I, I the I think you're 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 maybe not recognising. I'm I, well, I'm sure you do, but I don't think you recognise what impact this has on on small voluntary organisations. It is an extraordinarily large amount of work responding to one of your investigations. You, I, I recently did one, um, and you sent about five pages of requirements, which took me my whole week and working from home to respond to. And I, and this was a complaint of the utmost triviality about the cleaning of a very small peri- uh, piece of piece of um, a hallway, um, which was not even the cult's responsibility. That's the kind of recognition I'd like to see. That actually, you know, w- what burden you are placing on us in 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 your in your investigations. Um, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything you can do, uh, but I I I I think everyone here would appreciate it if you actually recognise that. What I would say, you know, we do appreciate when we send out those requests for evidence for our investigations. <clears throat> there is standard information we ask for from everyone. If you've got concerns about meeting the deadline or or the breadth of stuff that's being requested, we'd always encourage you to get in touch with us, have a conversation with the person making that request and clarify how much of that may actually be needed. And we can have that open conversation with you then. I did. And you didn't respond to me because you you said you didn't have enough staff. You didn't have enough resources. I did wonder why you took on the investigation when you didn't have enough resources to deal with it. I got no response to my request for an extension. So I, I simply worked late every night for a week. I'm really sorry that we didn't respond to that. I'm just going to interject um, because actually we're, we're really close to the time we need to, to finish up here. Um, but just to say that actually the, the complaint handling code is, is there to really um, encourage landlords to resolve things with, within their own internal complaints procedure. It's there to try and prevent cases from coming to the ombudsman, actually. It's it's there to try and, you know, better the complaint handling locally with, with you guys. Um, so the more that we 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 can try and en- encourage landlords to comply with that complaint handling code, hopefully the less complaints are going to be coming to us for investigation. I'm going to stop there um, and just ask. I can see Katie and Terry both had their hands up. I'm sorry we can't get to those. If you <coughs> do put your questions in the chat, um, though, before we wrap up, um, we what we'll do is any questions in the chat that haven't been answered today. Um, we will go through those and we will circulate those after the webinar, um, along with the, the recording and things and the, and the slides. Um, so thanks everybody for attending today. Um, th- this will be available for you to watch back. Um, and as I say, there's that the, the support available if you want to message us, um, email us, sorry, at that compliance inbox, you can do so. There's lots of information on our website. Um, but yes, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for Kirsty and my team for your help today. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye.